All right, welcome everybody to our, um, well, I guess deep learning lecture. To, today, it's a real pleasure to have Nilo Mitra here. Um, Nilo is a professor at UCL. Um, he is also leading the Europe lab um, of Adobe Research. And I think it's fair to say that everybody pretty much who has done ever anything about 3D geometry um, knows Nilo's work. Um, he's a pioneer in the field. He has been incredibly active in the SIGGRAPH and also nowadays in the computer vision and machine learning communities. Um, his work is recognized across all these fields. And I think it's really exciting to see how his research developed from classical geometry processing now a lot into using machine learning and again, driving the field forward. He's, he was rewarded many awards so far um, and to no surprise, um, you can see um, many cool research papers from him appearing basically on a daily basis. So I'm very, very happy to have him here. I've learned a lot from him so far, and I, and I hope he's sharing some of this cool work um, with us today. Um, thank you, Matthias, for this introduction, for the very generous introduction. It's a pleasure to be uh, speaking to this audience. Uh, I really look forward to the wider group at TV. UM for doing amazing research in, in the graphics and the vision community and also in simulation and uh, also many others uh, I, I would know in this area at TUM. Um, today I'm going to talk about uh, machine learning but more from the graphics point of view and uh, hopefully um, raise some issues of what type of things are missing and what would be nice to have moving forward and these are how we select research topics in this area. So what we are focusing on is uh, creating content, whether it's 3D or vector graphics or audio or video, but being controllable, right? And one, um, one problem in this domain is often we do not have high quality supervision uh, information in a volume and in a format and in representation that we would need to have supervised approaches. So this talk is how can we work around that problem and use our graphics understanding to address these challenges. For example, I'll start with this emoji icon that you see here. So this is a vector graphics, but it has been created by using raster input, right? So how do you train a, like a vector graphics autoencoder using raster input and how then you can interpolate in that space? And of course, the, there are many applications of this type of work. Now, before we switch there, I want to show uh, quite an earlier work a couple of years back where we wanted to demonstrate like if we have supervision data in the form we need, in this case, we had 3D access to 3D LiDAR data, texture uh, patches, et cetera, we could create high quality geometry along with texture. So this is a reconstruction around my office at uh, Houston in, in London. But um, often that's not only the type of uh, data we want. We want to enable sketching, which is still by far the most common way of uh, doing concept prototype at the very beginning. And it's a favorite one by artists. Um, and as you see, this is very, very fluid, but very sort of ambiguous. And of course, we do not have enough information or enough available data to learn from because um, it's, it's hard to get access to the work sequence of artists in large volumes. And the same applies when we go to CAD models. Right? So we have sequence of operations that are created. And in both cases, uh, this is uh, working out the same sort of spray bottle. And it's not a surprise because this is a very standard sort of first exercise for many designers to create sketch models. It's possible to find them. So the, so the left mode is very quick and approximate, and the right one it's, it's, it's very precise, but requires a lot of skill to control these modeling paradigms. At the end, the goal is, can we create a 3D model? Right? And uh, as we'll see in this talk, we can, um, it's nice to be able to go between these modalities in form of training. So to uh, list the challenges we have of creating a high quality geometric content, it's first one, of course, always comes out what representation should we work on, whether it's fine cloud, voxels, or some implicit representation, et cetera. How do we handle topological and geometric changes as well as material properties? Do we have like a, a 
starting from scratch modeling session, scanning or some sort of underlying language or procedure that controls or regularizes the problem. And as we'll see, can we explicitly avoid using 3D data? Because that has a lot of advantage because often it's this is a single most pain, for, pain point to get like a high quality and high volume of 3D data. So as you know, Matthias and his group, they have collected the ScanNet and Matterport, these type of data set, but they're very hard to collect in, in even bigger uh, number and sizes. And finally, I would like to end today's talk by showing like how much of 3D do we explicitly need or we can think more at, at capture and modeling in, a, in an abstract and deeper space. So today's talk, I will talk about four uh, sort of sub areas. Uh, that with the same theme. So first I will talk about how do we work with vector data where we have access only to raster data. So we have as we want to output SVG, but we have only access to raster data. Uh, how can we regularize a problem by having procedural 3D data? What if we do not have 3D uh, objects, but only have image examples or uh, of these uh, words? And then um, we'll talk about uh, object aware senior your presentation and how compos and compositionality comes into play as we move forward. Many of these works are very recent and they're going to be presented uh, next year or the, uh, sorry, next two weeks or, or three weeks. So it's a, this is a often the first time I'm going to present these works. Um, and these icons that I showed the uh, images are the main students who worked on that, students and postdocs. So uh, the first problem we're looking at is uh, is what how can we go from a, a vector data sorry a raster data as you see on the left and maybe some understanding of what are the base elements to a composition of the scene right to, to get get a decomposition of a scene so this is a very classical uh, inverse problem setup and there's a lot of template matching algorithms over the years on this. But still, it remains an ill-posed problem, and there are many sort of parameters to tune in traditional approaches, um, and even in batch-based batch approaches, template-based, what feature to use. And particularly, it's challenging when we have a lot of occlusion, as we see here. And I'll explain these images as we go. So patterns uh, are very common in the world, but often um, we have access only to rasterized versions. That means we don't have the underlying representation, which are the elements along with their composition, but instead we have access to a pixelated world, right? Where we have uh, RGB value that, at a discrete number of places. Okay. So that's one of the first challenge that how do we edit these objects? Now, um, it's not hopeless. One can load them in Illustrator uh, but then it becomes tedious trying to manually reconstruct this, this structure that was there when, when it was created. So one has to manually group these elements and then um, you have to do it for each element and then move them around and try to create their understanding of, the, of their placement. And then of course they can have rotation, scaling and all these extra parameters. And the more the number of these degrees of, of freedom, then we have more number of the search space becomes harder to navigate. So instead, what we enable is we enable uh, what this work allows is it creates a decomposition of this original image into these layers, into a stack of layers. Essentially, it's, it understands the structure. By structure, we mean the element location and their um, relative orientation along with scale and rotation. And now it becomes easy to group them based on element class and, and to do edits that you would expect uh, them to do. So this, this, all, this is the end goal and that's what we want to enable. There is another um, thing that sort of led us originally to, to as a motivation and coming from the Adobe side, this was quite natural that Although we have seen tremendous uh, progress in, in deep learning tools for images, somehow the vector world is lagging behind. And if we take any vector representation given an images and apply any of the successful deep learning methods, for example, uh, texture synthesis or super, not super resolution, like ex expanding out this image, 
then um, often the original structure is lost. So as you see here on the left, they, these leaves are no longer the same leaves. They get sort of distorted and warped up. One can come out with specialized methods for doing this, but it would be nice if we can have an intermediate step that allows us to benefit for the deep learning on images, but in the vector world. And that's what we work on. To, so to summarize, we have two problems, like how do we do editing in the wild and how do we keep the, the original structure of the patterns? And the first one we are going to solve with the layered representation and we will in the process also preserve the element structure. Okay. So here's uh, what we are going to enable. So we want to have these patterns on the left along with the element types and we want to give out this layered representation. Right? Now, there's a few challenges that we have to work around. Right? Now, one challenge is we do not quite know how many number of um, each element we have. So we have to account for a missing uh, unknown number of elements to start. Then we don't have uh, the, the layering order that we have that one object is in front of another, which is a discrete uh, sort of choice. Um, that is not easily differentiable because it's a discontinuous one, right? And we need to make it differentiable. Um, and the final thing is we have to deal with this raster nature of the data we have. So how do we enable this? Um, and once we can do that, once we have done that, you can do easy search and replace type operation to come up with new, new ones, uh, even with scaling and rotation. Okay, so that's our parameterization. For each element, we have a type. You can see these are the types. Um, and then we have a CI, which is a center location, and this is a theta. It's one degree because it's in 2D. And, and ZI is the interesting part, which is the ordering, the depth ordering, or the relative ordering of these elements that we are finding. And if we have element that is behind one object, that, that means it will be occluded. And this would enable us to handle this unknown number of elements. And in the forward pass, what we can do is we can take this and render it out. So let's talk about um, how this traditional thing works. This is the traditional composite pipeline where uh, it, as object in front occludes anything in the back. Right? But we want to make it differentiable and we will make a certain changes to make it happen. Okay, so uh, we will have um, assignment of patches per point, and I'll explain that. We'll have to handle this translation and occlusion, and we have to handle this unknown number of point uh, patterns to start with. So um, the first step, the, the algorithm can be simply thought in two main steps. One is a transform, transform function, and another is a combination function. So for the first one, the transform function, what we need to do is we have, um, I'll go to this one. So what we will do is we have the transformations, which are the center and the orientation, which are unknowns, but can be back propagated through. Then subject to this thing, it's really a resampling of the original base image. So if I know CI and theta i, I can resample the original image to find the pixel value at this new location. So that's a simple part. The, the second part is what makes it more interesting um, is how do we select if an element is going to be uh, preserved or not, or shown or not. And what we do is because we don't know the, un, the number of elements to start with. So if an element uh, by the Z unknown Z ordering ends up behind the background canvas, that's how it can be hidden. And that's how we handle the unknown number of elements as we will see. Okay, so we talked about the transform function. Let's now talk about the tra uh, combination function. So a traditional visibility model is, is really discrete as you will see here, but we, uh, to make it continuous, we make it um, soft. So we make it very much like a, like a soft function here, very similar to the soft RAS in, in the rasterization domain and also the, the differentiable rendering domain, we make it uh, into, a, a, instead of a binary function, more like a, a, a continuous function, and that allows us to blend across multiple like, layers. And we have, uh, I forget where, I think smaller value means closer to us. 
And then what we can do with this uh, one single change is we can take an image along with the elements. We start with, uh, with a very high number of elements. So this is uh, uniformly spread out this element over the location. And at each location, there are four elements as you see here. And then we run the optimization. And what the optimization is solving is the location, the CIs, the, the theta i's, as well as the z i's. Right? And in the end, the goal is as close as we can get to the original image. So it's differentiable uh, rendering, but in the context of, of vector graphics and rasterization. So you can think of differentiable rasterization. And as you see here, we can sort of see through the images because we have made it, it soft, but once we solve it, we discretize the solution to get back the final hard composite. Right? And anything that ends up beyond the, the, the final background layer that's occluded and then hence removed. Okay. Now let's get back to the problems we had. So now what we can do is we can go from an image to this uh, element wise representation. And then we can think of the expansion problem in the discrete element space. And then uh, we have the, uh, the differentiable composite to work out an image space loss. And this allows us to uh, now optimize using deep learning methods for images, but operating on vectors because we have this uh, differentiable uh, compositing stage. And as you can see here, now we have sort of expanded out the pattern, but now these sharks are preserved along with very realistic occlusion order. And whether you use L2 loss in the image space or some style loss, these are all going to be uh, possible because we have sort of enabled the link between the vector graphics domain and the image domain. So that's the main sort of insight that we are going to present at Sigrav Asia this year. So now from the vector domain, we are moving to 3D, but 3D in a slightly different format. 3D in the form of programs that generate 3D. So each of these uh, objects, uh, which are uh, from the structure net data set, which we did uh, last year, which are objects, which are a collection of, uh, of parts, along with the structure, the structure being the hierarchy of the parts. But what is um, the, the novelty here is the information is more on the programs that we see on the, on the top. So we are trying to come up with the latent space of programs and then optimizing in that latent space uh, leads to new programs interpolating in that latent space new to uh, interpolated programs that can be executed to come out with new, uh, new shapes. Why do we care about this? Because I think this has a lot of advantages and we have uh, some of the first steps in this direction, but if you are successful with our agenda, I think it combines uh, two very powerful domains. So one is um, a generative domain where from a latent space, we can extract out an, an object or image, in this case, a 3D collection of boxes or a procedural one or language where we have semantic handles on heights, widths, and other things um, that controls these program or a procedural step to generate these ones. Like traditionally, the right approach is the right as in the right side is has been very difficult uh, because it requires a human to write these programs. And that's that's again the bottleneck of getting a large amount of these uh, programs or good programs. What we are going to enable is a hybrid approach that allows us both types of control. How are the both types of controls going to be? So we can now sample from our program latent space and each point will unroll to a new program. Um, and then we can interpolate in the latent space that we gives a new program that when executed, we will get the shape. Now, um, one advantage of working in this space is it allows us now to have interpolation directly on the right by the latent space, or we can go to one of the programs we found and change certain of the parameters. So you can change the size of the cuboids or how they're attached, et cetera. And then we get like a change shape. 
Now, uh, to set the right expectation, what we unfortunately do not uh, do yet is we do not execute the programs while we are learning the programs, right? So the execution happens afterwards. So ide ideally it should be differentiated through the execution and the loss function through the, should be in the 3D object space, but that's not quite the case. I will highlight it again after I explain the method. Okay, so um, we need, uh, so that, that's something I talked about that we combine the benefit of both these worlds. But let me explain the representation because now we have to represent what is our language. So we need to have a representation of a language. This uh, domain specific language is hand coded now. So let me explain this. So if you look at the top left, first we instantiate a collection of boxes. I like uh, cuboids a lot. So a lot, you'd see a lot of cuboids in our work. So we have a collection of boxes and you see they are all generated as a cluster in a canonical space. Then there are constraints that sort of starts putting the boxes together. So we, we sort of let's say connect the yellow box to the blue box, the box one to two, and then they become stacked together. And the sizes gets relatively uh, adjusted based on their uh, connections. Right? And then you do it progressively. Okay. Um, I want to highlight the constraints of that attached statement. So one attached statement is uh, these two boxes, I show it in 2D, but in 3D has some connection point and they sort of get welded together. There's no rotation, sort of uh, just moves by a translation. The second attach point is, um, is also uh, a bit more tricky. As you see here, they can also have a rotation to allow these points. Uh, and the third one is sort of like a fill command or what we call the squeeze command. So you say the blue one should be squeezed between the, the, uh, the orange and the, and the green box and sort of it expands and spreads out and fills in the space. Okay, so that's our language. So for each of these 3D examples, we have a procedure to create the corresponding language. So that's our training uh, training set, as we see here. So this is what one particular model expanded out. Because these are trained on, uh, generated from the structured net data set that we used before, what is quite important, we have this hierarchy. So we have like a chair being decomposed into the top, into the base, into, into the seat, and that gets, uh, that is in the structure in how these are stored, right? So you see it in the sub function, the chair, the chair base, and the chair back. Okay, so now we can create a VAE in this space, and uh, programs are going to make use of this known part structure. So you can probably guess what type of methods we are going to use. It's, it's sort of a sequence with hierarchy and we use um, a, a GRU for this, for the encoder. Uh, so we go from a child and then it, it uh, encodes and uh, goes back to the parent and et cetera. And we have this uh, mu and sigma to control this variational space. The decoder, we just go the other direction and we have a termination condition at some point, uh, as, a, a node decides if it has any more further child. If if not, it stops, and that's how the program terminates. Okay. Uh, to look into the particular uh, line decoder box, so these are uh, a stack of lines because we have a uh, a domain specific language. We support a, a fixed set of commands, and each of them is indicated by by a type. So there's like a maximum length we have for, let's say we have 10 type of commands. So it's generating a 10 length vector determining which command it is along with their parameters. Right, so that's how we do it. If we would do it again now, we'll probably use a transformer rather than uh, just type of a GRU approach, but that's uh, a smaller details here. So let's see how it works. You can sample directly from this space. And when we do the sample, this is, 
uh, sampling in, in the program space. Right? And you, we show in green uh, the, the nearest neighbors uh, in the program space and the geometric space to show that it's, it's uh, different from, from the original one. So the network is learning something useful. The red points denote the attach points, like how, they're, how the boxes are attached. Uh, 3D PRN is one that is trained uh, for this, uh, this is one of the competing methods that trained on a different types of supervision that you can see because ours has this access to the hierarchy and the attachment points, it gets to more sort of what we call rooted designs. So it's physically more uh, sort of connected and then fall apart. And StructureNet is the version we showed last year, uh, which was operating at the level of, of boxes, but not at the level of programs. And they have their own merits and uh, disadvantages. We can interpolate in this space. So we can go from source to target. So what you can do is we take a shape, we project it into the latent space, in the program latent space, and execute. And the blue row is, is the shape SMD interpolation. We can do edits, as we, this was one of the stronger motivation. Uh, this part can be stronger. Uh, we are working on refinement of that because the original structure, uh, structure pro uh, sorry, shape program uh, allows edits, but we were not completely satisfied with the expressibility of the edit. So we are working on improving this part. Uh, this should not come as a surprise. It can, of course, we can have trained separate encoder to go from point cloud or meshes to this latent space. So we can now go from points to directly to programs for that. Uh, we can also optimize because our uh, DSL ex uh, execution is differentiable. So we can further refine the parameters as you can see here with the optimized parameters. Um, uh, another contemporary work that we're also presenting at Segravasia, which takes this idea forward and says that instead of just executing the programs, now we want to link to sketches because that's one of our inspiration uh, in the domain of um, industrial sketching where but that's the modality where people will work on. And the goal is from user sketch, can we directly get the program, in this case, the inferred CAD instructions, which when executed produces the, the CAD on the, on the right. And this is originally we thought about this would be super cool to have when we saw um, the, the work on, on scan to CAD a few years back uh, coming from the TUM group. Now, um, something I want to emphasize here, this was not obvious when we started is the choice of CAD instruction, same as the DSL instruction before in, in the previous example, um, is quite important because it's, it, it is this other form of regularizer that we are using. The, because the language can only have these type of operations, it regularizes the space of models it can produce and which works in our benefit. Uh, so one of the earliest observations we made was the domain of sketching, um, which is going uh, progressively, we, we have the ordered sequence of sketch. So you have the progressive drawing of lines. And um, so some artist is drawing out this, uh, this vacuum cleaner. In the 3D world, they would also do a very similar workflow, which is the CAD modeling workflow to start with the cube, add wheels, maybe bevel the corner, et cetera. And they can all be named as a certain set of operations. So both the sketching um, and the CAD model, they have a very similar workflow, which helps a lot. Because what now we can do is, all we have to do is we have to identify which operation this user is indicating when he or she is sketching. And that's, uh, as long as we can do that, we have determined like which command uh, is to be executed and we can do a fitting to infer the parameters. Okay, so without uh, going into the explicit details, what it, we would do is we will start with the sketching and you see the, this orange lines is the sketch and anything before is what we call context, which is the inference about the 3D we had made so far. And it turns out that this is quite a critical part, the sequence, because this inferred 3D tells us about what are the normal directions along which things can be extruded, et cetera. So this context comes out to be um, very important to, 
to solve this uh, otherwise ill-posed problem. And then we run sketch to CAD, it infers operation. So what it infers is, is the bottom line that add a polyhedral at, at this point, and then we are doing a fitting to find out the parameters. But once we do this enough, we get the final shape. Um, and it's quite fun to use the system. You can, you can try to use it yourself. So uh, that, that's where the user would draw. Um, these are the final edits that you can do on the inferred program. And on the, on the top right, you can change the, not the change, you, you get to see the program that it has inferred. And it is sequential, so that's very important. So let's see this example, so which is the vacuum cleaner that we saw before. We didn't have um, access to a tablet at that point. So this is done with the mouse one. So it's a bit cumbersome to use at that point, but ideally this should be on a tablet where you'll draw and get like a much more direct feedback. Uh, to infer and on the top right, you would see the inferred uh, condition that the bevel corner is being done. Like here, uh, a wheel is being extruded, so some sort of extrusion. And because we have the face of the vacuum cleaner before, we know in which direction the things are going to be, and we can use that to rectify the curve and other things. Right? So the context is super critical to get this to work. Right? Uh, we allow some um, explicit uh, constraints about symmetry and reflection, but that's more uh, added as a new Y rather than at the sketch level. The inference is what you see on the top. Up, right. So the real message for this part is with very simple inference, as we see in the top right, as we saw, saw in the shape assembly, we can produce um, very powerful or very complex looking final shapes. And that's often the advantage of working in a domain specific language. But there, there are limitations. The limitation is the language has to be manually specified, something we are working on to to address right now, can we infer the, the, the primitives in the language type? Uh, it is still at the coarse resolution of boxes and cylinders. Um, we do not have a direct coupling between the final execution right, and the control of the learned latent spaces. We, we have very basic control in terms of interpolations. And the biggest thing, in my opinion, is we still don't differentiate through the programs. So the final one is not uh, executed until the program is generated. Okay. Um, let us move to the second part of the talk. Uh, I'd like to revisit a paper from, from last year where um, we discussed the following problem, and which is uh, a centuries old, uh, uh, where the problem is we don't have access directly to 3D measurements, but only to image domains. And this is very, very relevant now because we don't have access to large number of 3D models, but we have lots of 2D information or 2D recordings, 2D camera recordings. Now, as soon as we realize this approach, the thing is the camera recording means we know a lot from our graphics background. That's the rendering pipeline. So if, if we have a 3D recording, we know how to generate the image. And that's the insight we use in this one and also in the next one. So let's look back at the image formation model. We have a 3D model, we have a view, and we have a color. We, we are uh, not quite handling material and illumination here. We create, create an image. And uh, the image examples is what we have. And we can use the known image formation model to pass the gradient back to the 3D generation. That's the main idea. Okay. And we are not going to optimize for the image formation model or the camera model. And this, I think, is, is a good insight to have. And others have also done this very recently. We use uh, various image formation model. Uh, we use the visual hull. We have the absorption only model, which has this uh, transparency as we go through. Or we have an emission model that which can emit, even emit in a model. So the, the middle one is close to the, to the NERF model that was proposed recently. 
Uh, it is the same one, but they, they use the positional encoding on top of this. And this is um, increasingly a very popular way of uh, differentiating when you want to link the 3D and the 2D domains. Okay, so let's see how this uh, workflow goes. So we have an input image or a set of input images. And there are two main ideas in this whole architecture. The first is we take it and encode it to some latent code. And then there is some generator that you're generating that creates a 3D volume, right? That the voxel volume. It can be implicit function. At that point, we use a set of voxels. Now, the main insight is this is ill post. We know that we, we cannot get this. Uh, this. This does not quite work in classical uh, computer vision. But the insight is if we now look at this 3D volume from, from random view directions, they a, a good reconstruction or a good generation should appear to be chairs from, from random view directions. Right? And that's what we can enforce by having a GAN setting. So we go through from the generator to a 3D volume, and then we have a fixed sort of camera uh, network that is differentiable by how we made it. It will create a, a rendered image. And then we are going to look at these uh, to a discriminator. And then uh, you can set up these uh, rendering function. There is one uh, caveat that is still a problem. And I, think, I hope that someone has a better idea how to do this, that we need this step where we need to sample these random views. Now, this works really well for a synthetic data because we, we know what is a view sample we use. But when we go to real images, it's not random. So if you think of taking uh, images of cars or images of chairs, just because of uh, normal affordances, we will position our camera in certain sort of biased locations for imaging the car or the chair. And our algorithm, the platonic GAN, is uh, taking a uniform view of sampling, and that's not quite correct. So ideally, we should also optimize for the view sampling distribution something we haven't been successful yet, but hopefully someone can also find this and, and, uh, uh, and learn the view sampling as we go along. And this uh, approach, which is uh, the last column, allows um, to very, very um, strongly remove the amount of supervision required. So we don't need any annotation. We are not relying on 3D, uh, 3D template, camera information. We don't need an SFM to start the thing. We can work on single single uh, view. We can also handle color using the emission, emission absorption model. Let's see how the results look. So we're starting with this black sort of observations or these images, and we are generating these voxel representation of, of, the, of these planes. Remember that the network never had access in any form uh, to direct 3D models, right? And that's that's why this is a, a, a result that we like, right? Of course, we can train um, uh, lots of GANs or even VAEs directly if we have lots of 3D planes to supervise, but this is not the case. We are only using image uh, supervision. Also works for chairs, even when they're complex sort of concavities or, or holes. Not as nice as structure net, but the type of supervision is entirely different. Right? And you would see the artifacts it produces in the bottom example, it has this rounded back, but it gets this more like flattened back as you get. Uh, it can use it for, for very different types of, uh, of domains and classes. So we look to some quantitative examples. There's a lot of numbers here. So let me help in, in looking at this. So we are, there's three modalities we have, the visual hull, the absorption only, and the emission absorption. And we're doing reasonably well with respect to other sort of strong baselines on, on all of them. And, and it's, it's also possible to supplement the method with 3D training. Uh, this is more as a exercise, how much we can uh, gain if we have additional 3D data, but it's not the, the really the, the platonic case, I would say, because that's, that's almost a cheating a bit if we are going in this direction. But we wanted to see how much uh, value 3D provides. We can use it to, to very, very random looking data like this mushroom data set. 
where uh, it's just we collected a handful of mushrooms from the web and manually segmented this. Uh, it, it's, the segmentation is still part of the input. And these are the reconstructions that are being generated from this. You can also use it for uh, volumetric data, for X-ray data, and we can get renderings out of this. Okay. So in the last part of the talk, I will take this idea further to go from images and videos, but not of a single object, but objects with composition. Um, so the, I, actually, I'm going to talk about two papers, but they are very linked and they are appearing at the same conference next week. Um, I, and you'll see why we are grouping them together. Once you see it in this light, you'll see that, of course, this is almost like one paper rather than two. So it's, it starts from Thu's work uh, that she did last year at ICCB, where they presented this hologan, which is something that I really like, which is, um, again, the similar goals as in platonic GAN, where the 3D structure is being in, uh, uh, directly enforced. So the 3D transform module we have is a fixed camera transform. The projection module is still a fixed camera module. Right. So these are not learned. The other sort of features, both 3D and 2D are being learned. And then they could do some amazing results. And I hope that many of you have already seen that, which is like going on real images and trying to do rotation and other things. Okay. But this is still benefiting from a single object, right? So the single scene and doesn't allow compositionality when we have multiple objects, which think is the next frontier, and that's what we want to handle. So what we enable is how we structure the network. So let me explain how we do this. So we take the original uh, sort of hologan idea, and what we do is now we have object level decomposition. So we have a background layer and a bunch of foreground layers. And in each of them, we have a grid of deep features that are being learned. The scene composition is also a learned function. We, we tried with a few up, uh, options, but it's, it's a very simple function. So we have these, say, multiple grids, there are voxel grids like K plus one. Then the scene composition is at each of these voxel grid, it looks across all these K plus one and does a max pooling or does a mean pooling. I think in the end, we did an average pooling. We found that was uh, that worked best. Okay. Um, and then uh, for the rotation, this is again a fixed module. So we, when we move the camera, we know which ray to trace. That means which features to pick up in doing the rendering stage. Uh, so that's the, the camera stage. And then we have the, the camera projection. Sorry, um, should decompose these. So camera means rotating and the projection means which features along these are to be picked, right? Uh, there are several knobs. There are knobs for the theta eyes that allows objects to be individually rotated. There's a three theta camera that means rotate the global camera. The projection unit is fixed, which is like the ray tracing to the deep volume. And then we have some 2D layers to generate the final, final image from this. That's a neural rendering stage, if you will. Okay. In contrast to Hologan, uh, the green part, which is the 2D features, is much more restricted. We found it was important to restrict the green part. Otherwise, the net network learns to cheat a lot on the right side. So we, we sort of uh, prevent it from doing it by only allowing 2D conv at that level. Um, and the rest is entirely on how this is structured. Okay. So at training time, how we are training this, is so this is unsupervised in the following sense. We give it a random sample of background and objects, and then that's what is trained. At inference time, we can change the object description, the background description. As you see here, this is already inference time. We can move the objects because now we have inferred its location. We can add new objects. Right? So you'll see new object being added. And um, we don't need any, any supervision other than we have a good distribution of these uh, variants in the input train. Okay. So I'll start with the less impressive results which are on synthetic data. And as you see here, um, we have two cars. Um, so let's look at the left one and we are going to individually rotate the car. 
or on the right one, we are going to translate the car back and forth. Notice that the network learns um, the shadow effects on, on the cars on the ground. And that's, that's a super uh, interesting one to see. In, in the case of chairs, it's a bit better visible. So when you rotate, you see that the, the shadow is moving on the ground. So it, it learns something quite interesting there. Uh, if you look carefully, you would notice that it's not quite uh, as you would expect. So sometimes there's a weird warping and that is again due to the view effect that some views are better sampled than others. Also, it's unsupervised. So it's not directly supervised with occupancy, which makes it difficult. Uh, here, when we move objects back and forth, and again, look at the shadow. I love looking at the shadow and see like how it sort of looks almost like it's a rendering in some sense, but it's, it's not, and it is learning something to, to do something quite interesting. Because it's unsupervised, we can be brave and try on real data. There's no segmentation in the input. So here is a result on rotating cars. And if you look carefully, you would see the artifacts. And again, um, our hypothesis is there are more artifacts around the view distribution. So you see some views are less represented and hence there are uh, artifacts whenever we go to these non-standard views. You can move objects left to right, but look at the background, they remain static. If you look at the hologram results, you would see that's not the case when they, there when they, because it's modeled at one scene, when you move the background changes, but here the decomposition in block can allows us to be, um, uh, to preserve the background. We can change the features of course, we can stretch the cars and minimally uh, do editing, or we can change the appearance as we do, right? Not only the position and appearance. Um, I'll talk about illumination later on. That's one of the ongoing efforts we are doing. Um, we compare with um, other methods. Of course, Hologan is easy to beat because it doesn't um, do all this object level decomposition, but also we compared with some image level GAN based methods, which has a higher level of supervision and we come quite close to that. Okay. These are object level edits. We can do rotation as we saw, uh, background, foreground interpolation. We can mix across different assets. We can start combining them, taking image from a color from other or another, some very basic material edits. Okay. And the, the bottom right one, you'll see new objects being added as we go. Okay. Now, um, one problem is if you were careful in observing BlobCAD, we do not uh, account for, for uh, really interrelation between the objects, which is often important. So if you think of a stack of, of blocks, you, we need to know the location of the bottom block so that the top block can be stacked, stacked on that. Uh, block, uh, block can completely ignores it. And hence, when we try it on a block sequence, you see like we, everything gets sort of uh, pushed back as the background. So there's no decomposition. Uh, that brings us to this uh, other paper, the relate one, which looks like an entirely different architecture, but actually it's not. The main thing I, I want you to focus on uh, is this block, which is the, the coupling block or the block that eff uh, effectively models the object interaction. So essentially what we're doing is we take the, the randomly sampled theta i's and then uh, these, this big gamma block which is a learned module, it tries to understand the interaction between the ob objects and update its states. So you can think of like a fusion state that updates the state based on the neighboring objects. And this is, uh, we modeled it by, by two MLPs, the FNGs. Um, and uh, this works quite well under different assumptions. So we have two different settings. One is what we call the ordered scene, what we know uh, the ordering, so like say the stack of the blocks, we know the first object, the second object depends on the first, etc. So it's like a Markov like setting. Um, and we can now work on the stack objects and come up with, with nice decomposition of these objects. We also work on the clever data set. In the second setting, uh, we also bring in time, so the dynamics. So now we are essentially solving an MLP to model the dynamics condition on the object uh, features and the object locations. So it's essentially learning a very simple 
not a PDE, but MLP version of object dynamics, right? So the, that's all it is doing, but conditioned on the, on the surrounding objects. And that's, uh, you can see here, so that's indicating a ball with two balls rolling on the ball. Uh, so it needs to learn this, um, this nonlinear trajectories because it has to respond to the underlying base ball. So it needs to know its, its own parameters. And these dots are the crosses uh, are our view of showing how well it follows the trajectory. So if you have a car in this case, um, so these, um, these dots indicate how closely it follows the sequence. Okay. Uh, I'll show it in the video and then it'll be better. So if you see here, um, the videos are not playing somehow. Okay. Um, uh, so uh, on, the, on the bottom, you would see that new cars are being added. And again, look at the shadows, so the right shadows are given. Again, note that there is no supervision. So we did not provide like, here's a background, here's a car, here's a perspective distortion that the network learns the decomposition as well as their parameters. And the car stays on, on the length. Uh, we already showed it on the stack data set, which is a stack of balls of, of these um, uh, cylinders and here and here's the sequence where we captured the sequence from from a, a street view camera and you see the cars moving in straight line or in trajectory so that's the real sequence and this is the relate sequence so these are completely generated in terms of decomposition in terms of predicting the dynamics and also in terms of the rendering you would see a couple of things that I find very very neat is the objects don't collide or go through each other. Objects, um, cars can turn around. And finally, the shadows, I love the shadows as you see. Uh, but if you see close in, in the last bottom right example, the car gets distorted, distorted a bit. This is a very strong perspective and the network is struggling so far on learning with the type of data it has access to. Okay, um, I'd like to end with this final question that do we really need this 3D data at all? Or can we really work in, a, in an abstract domain? And that was inspired by the StyleGAN work that we had seen that generates these amazing images. Um, and what we enable in this work is you can do a lot of 3D edits by working in directly in the latent space. Right? So you can do illumination, pose, expression, et cetera, on, on directly. I'll skip the, the pipeline here. Uh, let me just I'll skip the pipeline. I'm happy to come back to this if you have questions. Sorry. Just want to show the result as because this is more like a probing question. Do we really need 3D? And here you see the quality of effects that we will have in terms of shadows. We don't have the expression examples in here. Um, and it would be very difficult to model this fidelity of results um, with, um, uh, with traditional graphics examples. So that brings us to the original goal we had is how much of this controllable content creation we can enable without having access to direct supervision. And, and many of these relates to neural rendering and you have some of the world experts in your group for that. So uh, I hope this was, uh, a thought provoking that how much can we stretch and learn from from uh, from data without direct supervision i think we would be all of them are using supervision in one form or another but the observation is some forms of supervision are much easier to capture than other um, in the later works in the blog can and they relate the final resolution is still a bottleneck it's a bit of compute problem and a bit of like amount of data we need I don't think that's like a showstopper for now. But I think the last sort of style flow is questioning, uh, allowing us to question how much of really uh, generation we need, or we should really be looking at uh, exploration in some fancy trained encoder space. Um, what we don't have yet is explicit control over materials and illumination, something we are actively working on. And I'm sure we are not the only one, but we don't have any. Um, like final results, we are quite close. So I think illumination, we can do so. Um, since like the nerf like setting comes out a lot these days and with many, many papers on archive now, there's like a good sort of question of 
overfitting versus encoder networks versus GANs, or do we expect to see more of this hybrid of these moving forward? Um, so with that, I will um, like to conclude my talk and I'll be happy to take a few questions. Thank you for your attention. Cool, awesome. Thanks a lot. Um, yeah, do we have any questions on Zoom? Hey, Niloy. <laughs> Thanks for the talk. Hi. Um, so I'm kind of curious, this is a bit of a higher level question. Like you asked this question at the end, do we really need like 3D? Um, so along the similar lines, like, do you think we can get towards this goal of controllable content creation and also without direct supervision all on this kind of pixel or voxel level basis of the last couple of works that you showed? Because I think what was interesting, like the, the previous um, several papers that you showed, like structure net and stuff like this, were all operating on a bit of a more mid-level intermediary kind of representation. So do you think that's actually enough to uh, leverage these kinds of modern <laughs> learning techniques um, at this very fine grained pixel voxel point level kind of representation to get both advantages? I do not have a final answer there. I think we are all trying to figure out the pieces of the puzzle, but of course we, we have a trade-off. I think we can work with coarse voxels but deeper features. So there is definitely one trade off there. But also for the output, is it really we need an image or a vectorized output? In, in many of the traditional workflows, they love vectorized output just because it's easily scalable and there's no, no loss of resolution there. Uh, and in, in certain case, we are also tied by the data sets we have access to. Uh, one thing that I think is a shortcoming, and I don't know of like amazing work in that area yet, is uh, 3D generation with extremely high quality. And by that I mean like almost like like we'll see in in um, in games and others with bump map and details and other sort of material properties. Right? And I think we we are still trying to figure out how we will reach that level of fidelity with the type of tools we have. Mm -hmm. I mean, then do you think that we should follow up with these kinds of representations that artists themselves are, are using? Because like the adversarial stuff seems very powerful, but it's also largely the easiest to use on these very regularly structured yeah. representations. I, that is definitely true. I, I think that's why it is uh, the, the vector stuff I showed at the beginning and also the differentiable rendering work I think allows us to have a bridge between more compact representation, but then have supervision at the image level or supervision at a more like standard level, right? So that's one thing that I've seen being used also in the animation community. Um, if that is the final answer, I don't quite know yet. Right? So I think we are trying to figure out, but this is like a super important question what you asked and it's, uh, Okay, the question is super important. I don't have the final last. <laughs> yeah. Hey, maybe a, a last question. Um, I don't know. I mean, I think this work when you're talking about like the language of models in a sense, right? I think that's a pretty cool line of research, right? In a sense, you're trying, when you go from sketches, right? You have, I mean, you, you have a line of work. It's not just one paper, right? Basically, you have some, some structure that you're essentially encoding in a, in a language. H how much, how do you how do you see this going? I mean, essentially, you want to replicate kind of an artist or kind of or like not replicate, but help an artist in a sense to make smart proposals, trying to learn what an artist would be doing. I don't know. How do you see this one going? Because yeah. I mean, practically speaking, this seems what we want to do as graphics researchers, right? Yeah, I think we would see a lot of work in this domain, and we uh, we were aware of there's a couple of like very recent data set that Autodesk released now on, on having access to these, um, what they call this uh, Fusion 360 to this intermediate sequences. I think that's the way to go. And we have seen it in NLP and others with transformers, how powerful we can predict sort of next operations. It's almost, can we get autocomplete to get rid of the mundane task for the users? 
Um, it is, it has been like last year, I did not have access to any data set like this, but this year we have, and, and I think we would see a lot more work in that. And I hope this is, uh, this opens up a lot of um, uh, opportunities to work in this space, right? And they eventually- So you think it's a question of data? I would actually argue, I don't think the data sets will help us. I mean, they will do some research, no, no question about it, right? There will be research inspired yeah. by it. But I'm actually a big fan of like, just looking in a sense, the same way what you're doing when you're saying, do we need 3D? Do we need the intermediate operations as temporary losses? Or can we do something like, I don't know, use reinforcement learning, just have the final output has to match and you have a set of operations and you're trying to kind of optimize what's the best path to get there. Yes, uh, I think there's two parts to that. One is you have done work on this RL one for modeling and that's super cool to do. Um, I think that naturally, I, I do believe that the choice of intermediate sort of operations is a bit sort of ambiguous and also it linked to whichever like um, modeling tools we're using. It's, it's not like playing like ground truth there, but most artists would do like a sequence and certain like in, in sort of course to find there is sort of a semantic sort of progression. I think that is more useful. Not like if you do an RL on the final end goal, that might be too far of a stretch and it can find some like very good parts to get there, but maybe too complex for, for yeah. artists to, to work around because it's too non-linear and maybe too hard to sort of parse and predict. So, yeah, I mean, the, the challenge is basically if you go only to the final goal, your combinatorics explode. It's, it's very difficult. You don't have enough constraints. That's why, well, I mean, we've done some stuff, but it, it works on small models only, right? It, it's very limited, of course. Yeah. Um, but I think the other problem you're going to have is when you have the intermediate goals, if you're collecting data sets, every artist will choose a different path to get there. And that's very hard to supervise. We tried that out a little bit. And it's always contradictory how they start. One of them start like this course to find thing and then other mm -hmm. ones start first with individual parts and then they merge them together. Yeah, yeah. So it's, this is a really big, I, I mean, it's fascinating. I, I think this is a really cool research area to work on right now. Yeah, um, yeah anyway, I think- I think it's a bit, a bit like sketching. Like we saw this when, when Tom had this, um, uh, Tom and um, Adam had this paper on, on sketching, but they collected the data set, although there was a lot of ambiguity, but still certain sort of points were common. Right? So we are hoping that certain points there is convergence yeah. and that's, that can be the intermediate points. Yeah. Cool, all right. Yeah, thanks a lot, Miloy. It was really fantastic having you. Um, I think we're a little bit out of, of time, so we have to probably ramp things up. Um, we really hope that this research is, of course, going forward. It's very exciting to see the combinations of vision, graphics, and learning right now. Um, and yeah, I mean, it was it was really fantastic to have you, and I hope um, a lot of people also um, follow these lines of research. So thanks a lot. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Okay, so I think I ended the stream. <laughs>